Okay, we're back with Caitlin. Caitlin, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fine. This is our episode two, listeners. In the first episode, Caitlin and I discussed how the Midwest has much more of a creative culture than it's getting credit for. Absolutely. And, and Caitlin and I talked about that. I've seen that kind of, I've seen glimpses of that in my own life. And I think the reality is that you know, culture often is, it, it, well, it's breaking physical boundar- physical borders, physical boundaries with social media and all that stuff. So anyway, the, the Midwest is on fire. That's what we talked about. Mm-hmm. We talked about... Uh, how Caitlin got into hair, found her way to the floor of her first salon uh, after a stylist hurt herself, which was unfortunate, but it gave Caitlin an opportunity. Um, And then Caitlin moved to Germany and she came back to get her license. She worked commission, then she worked independent, and now she has her own salon. So we're going to pick up from there. And I'm really curious. So normally, Caitlin, when we do two episodes... I write down what we just finished talking about in the first episode, and then I write down what I want to talk about at the beginning of the second episode. So my first question is kind of a funny one, and I'm wondering why I thought this. I, you're a colorist. You focus on color, right? You also have uh, you also cut, though, correct? Yes. And you're you have very creative cuts. We talked about this in episode one. Um, but I was really curious to ask you, do you use bond builders at this point in your career? Uh, well, the, the supplies that I use with Schwarzkopf has bond technology already built into it. Mm -hmm. Um, what technology I feel like still is not built into products at this moment is polypeptide chain, um, restoration and stuff like that. The things that hold the bonds, the, mm-hmm. the chain that like literally holds the bonds in there. And mm-hmm. that's why I do still use K18 at this moment. As of right now, I do feel like most of the bond technology is in there. Um, but so I don't use any sort of additives, but I do prep with K18 and stuff like that. So this is one of those conversations where it's impossible, maybe not impossible, it's difficult and very, very rarely is somebody willing to kind of go out there and say, Yes, Olaplex is better than K18. K18 is better than Olaplex. This works better. That doesn't work better. I like this. I like that. People feel a little bit nervous that they're going to upset someone or the differences aren't, they don't have the confidence to speak very clearly about the differences. There's The differences aren't that clear. But I suspect you might be willing to have a really strong opinion on this. So why, let's just start off with why why K18 and not Olaplex? Because they're two completely different technologies. If you um, are using, I, I think that Olaplex is very integral if you're using color that does not have that type of technology built into it. Definitely use something like that. Um, however, it is important to be educated as to like what bond builders are in comparison to what polypeptide restoration and build, building is. Um, and it's also important to understand the difference between Olaplex and other bond builders in my experience um, and why it will affect in some ways your performance behind the chair in good ways and then not bad ways, but there might be room for adjustment of how you formulate. At least the last time I used Olaplex, that's kind of how it was. Um, there okay. was def- you definitely had to like adjust how you mixed, how things processed, all that stuff. But after a while, I started using things that already had the technology built into it. Um, a bond is a completely, a disulfide bond is a completely different thing than a polypeptide chain. Um, so the polypeptide chain, as I said, holds the bonds. So K18 is focused on the chain and the bonds. Um, whenever you're just working with a bond builder, that's only focused on the bonds. If the chain is disrupted, you can't do anything with the bonds. So it's really just about understanding the technologies behind it and why it exists in the first place. And it's not so much like a what's better than the other. It's about what problem are you trying to address? How deep are you trying to get with hair and keeping it, um, keeping its integrity and stuff like that. If you have somebody that is 
very on the cusp. I mean, I don't see how you can't use K18. And just for the podcast, I'm say- I'm not sponsored by K18. I have no, uh, I have no affiliation. But just based on um, the information and the science behind it, if you truly want to get to the core, you should be using K18. And if your color doesn't have a bond builder built in, then an additive such as Olaplex is definitely necessary. So that's one of the big changes that's happened in the last three, four, maybe somebody would correct me and say, you know, five or so years, where a lot of the uh, a lot of the color, the developer, all of the inputs, they've improved, right? Some of them have become less harsh or they've incorporated some kind of bond building component into them, which has uh, convinced some colorists that they don't need a bond builder on top of it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So um, you are a Schwarzkopf artist now, but uh, you might have been using something else before. Uh, Does Schwarzkopf have bond building components in their color? Yes. Almost the entire line, especially within their blonding technology. It has bond building in it. But not polypeptide? No. Okay, components. Okay, got it. So, and that's why you like the K18 with the Schwarzkopf product that has the bond builder in it. Yes. So you you don't need a bond builder with the Schwarzkopf product that has a bond builder in it. Yeah. Right? At that at that point, it would just kind of be a waste of product. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Is more better in the case of building bonds in hair? It's not going to hurt anything, but look at it this way. It's kind of like taking a vitamin when you don't have a deficiency. Like Yeah, you just you pee al- it out. Yeah, you're already equipped with what you need internally um, and what you've already ingested. If you take a vitamin, it's not going to hurt you most of the time, You're just, but it's going to be a waste. Your body's just going to get rid of it. So you're kind of still wasting your money a little bit. Got it. Well, wasting your money a lot because this stuff's yeah. expensive, right? Yes, very much. <laughs> and and we're not sponsored by anybody, so I, I'm not loyal to any particular brand. I, I know a lot of brands uh, have bond building components in them now. So I think that's really been great for everyone. It has required that the hairdressing community keep up with the information, though, hasn't it? I mean, when you mentioned Olaplex and the need to adjust certain uh, quantities... And that has been one of the gripes with our hairstylists for many, many years, going back to 2015, 16, when they, when Dean first started bringing it into our salon to give it to Guy Tang. The the reality was that there was a learning curve with how much developer you needed to use, or you, did you need to use uh, more more color? Um, it and it of course. Uh, uh, elongated the duration. It extended the duration of the processing time, didn't it? Like by a pretty significant amount. Yeah. And from, when, so, from what yeah. I understand, it's because it's um it's a more like water based product, and so therefore, I mean, water and lightener, it can only slow things. So, from what mm-hmm. we understand, and once again, I haven't taken an Olplex class in years, but from the feedback I've gotten, that's still kind of it's true okay all right so with with the ingredients that you're currently using with Schwarzkopf uh, k18 is a is the right choice for you but if somebody's using color without a bond builder then Olaplex might make sense still that's absolutely. kind of what we're saying yeah absolutely yeah <clears throat> okay what what say you about the whole controversy the lawsuit remember this with the, I think there are like 75 clients who sued Olaplex because they said that their hair was falling out. Do you remember that? I do remember that, yes. So what was your take on all that? I couldn't really and totally say um, because I didn't look into each case by any means. However, um, I did experience clients that bought Olaplex independently and use the um, take-home regimen and number three particularly right yeah and whenever they used it it they it it was three clients in particular and they all had the same feedback at first the hair just felt 
incredible. And thereafter, they felt like their hair felt like it was actually more damaged. They felt like they were experiencing more breakage. Mm -hmm. When it comes to what was actually going on, I have no idea because I'm very consistent in what I use with my clients. But the fact that I did have three that kind of reported the same thing and I just said, hey, this has been kind of a thing that's, you know, surfaced in the industry. I would recommend the, the best case scenario for you at the moment is to halt that treatment and see if you see better results. Yeah. And they did. I mean. <laughs> and, and they did see better results. They halted and saw better results. Yes. And yeah. th the thing is, like, that could be a number of factors. I mean, we are in the Midwest whenever it comes to things that are in people's water, when it comes to treatments, medications, you know, we, we could go through a lot of different case scenarios. So that's not to, like, totally knock what has happened with Olaplex. I'm at the, mo at the moment, I'm at an interim of there could be something there because there were enough accounts. There mm -hmm. could be something that all of those accounts, though, to have in common that those particular people, it caused negative reactions and results. Mm -hmm. it's, it would take a lot of deep diving to know um, because there is, has been a lot of positivity with Olaplex as well. So that's kind yeah. of where I'm at with it. But I think more information needs to be invested in and definitely gathered for the sake of hair health and... Um, yeah, integrity and all that stuff. My understanding is that people were overusing it, that it's a uh, protein-related product, and mm -hmm. overusing a protein-related product can do damage, whereas uh, whereas it, it, uh, with the right regimen, with the right use, um, it helps. So that was, that's kind of been my conclusion after talking to various people. Okay. Um, and, and and it seems like those who experience that damage, you know, they they admit to overusing. But anyway, I've heard uh, that in other that lines too. Like over keratinization mm -hmm. definitely will do, cause wear and tear on hair. So maybe the um, the solution perhaps is just to have more information for if you're gonna if you're gonna send it out into the world to where people can just buy it all willy nilly and you're not gonna have like education behind it or educators or reps or anything like that behind it, then you might want to be very clear on yeah. on the importance of how to use it. And, but also that's why you need a hairdresser. These are case by case basis. Like we can look at your hair and we can feel and see maybe if you do need more keratin or you don't need more keratin, this is just dryness. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so that's kind of why it's, it's a gray area releasing that stuff into the world. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's super subjective, and Olaplex would probably tell you we have countless videos, you know, on our website that tell you what to do and how to do it. But if you know what percentage of people actually go on there and, and watch, right? Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> it's always an interesting conversation, the bond building thing. What yes. what are you what are you seeing behind the chair these days? You're you're educating, mm -hmm. and you're behind the chair about how many days? Four days a week. Four days a week. And what are you seeing with client behavior? Any changes in the last six months, two years? I mean, everything definitely has shifted 90s style for the past, like, I don't know, five or six months, I feel like, with people desiring, like, the kind of blowout and they want the flip. They don't necessarily want, like, the, the, the curls and stuff like that. Everything was very, like mermaid hair like glam and then for a while it was like lived in balayage but with the like we're seeing blowout central we're also seeing skinny bangs like tiny mm -hmm. tiny little morsel bangs like 80s style too um which i think is really fun like when i first was uh asked to cut them i was like i've seen this a lot i was like but man i'm gonna really have to go back to retrain my brain how to just take a, a tiny bit and cut it and style it that way so it was kind of like reminiscent to to go back and start to learn how to create these looks again. Um, that's what I see as far as like cuts and styles. Um, I can't believe how many people I used to blow out and then curl that are just like, no, leave it at the blowout. I like it this way. Mm -hmm. um, as far as color goes, I think that, I mean, I think that things were a little boring for a little while, <laughs> personally. Um, things definitely shifted back into balayages and naturals and hair extensions, which I think 
I mean, as somebody who doesn't really do a lot with my own color, that is like tried and true. But man, I was like, what's going to be the next thing to kind of like break through that's going to like blow our minds a little bit? Like in, you know, what Rebecca and I were talking about this weekend, the before times. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm still not totally seeing that, but I have been teaching a technique called soft blocking. It's a mix between, it's a softer type of color blocking. And that has been like hitting home for a lot of people whenever I teach it. Um, It's Mm -hmm. kind of a, it's a mix between some of it, like kind of interweaves with like some of these different looks that people want. And it can apply to even the new styles that we're seeing emerge through. But color wise, I'm really excited to see what hits the surface because I don't know. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm well, ready to see what Maybe you should want. be the one to shake it up. I'll keep trying. I posted something today that's just taken off. I can't believe it. <laughs> Hold on a minute. We're going to get that. I'm on the gram as we speak. It's my model from yesterday's class, and I can't – I mean, I never know what's going to for sure do well, but people are – I think it's hitting like all the autumn feels and it is also Mm. creative and it is the soft blocking that I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. So for the listeners here by Caitlin, uh, oh my gosh, I think I lost the pronunciation of your last name. Um, Tichka. Yes. You got it. Yeah. I know I got it right out of the gate on episode one. (laughs) (laughs) No, you did, but I'm like still impressed that you retained it. I never expect that. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Okay, so I'm on Hair by Caitlin Titska. And you're, okay, hold on. This is not your pinned post. It would be from seven hours ago. Yes. And, oh, yes, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, so... Kind of a kind of a fall. I mean, there's de- this is definitely in the creative color category, but with that kind of fall vibe, with the the autumn colors. But you've got kind of a a steel blue in there, like a grayish blue, which looks amazing. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. I love it. It's got almost a little bit of the oil slick nature to it with the with the bluish ends, which is really cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, listeners, go down there and check it out. So this is, let's see, we're recording this on, what is the date today? This is September 9th, so check it out. Um, all right, so let's say, Caitlin, you are in charge, and I know this is going to make you shudder, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> you are in charge of all style for the entire industry, and it's up to you to lead the industry in a certain direction with color what where would you take everyone yeah that you know you are challenging me with that one (laughs) where would I take everyone I mean my biggest thing that I think that retention is the most important quality to any sort of thing that we do especially for anything that can be long lasting okay so I would say doing a mix between naturals and fashion shades will Mm -hmm. a scratch the itch of wanting to be creative while simultaneously keeping you harboring like something that can be slightly more lower maintenance for people. Mm -hmm. And it also complements each other. That's kind of what's going on in that photo. And that's Mm -hmm. not, I mean, the thing is that that technique that I did that is not the first time I started doing that like six years ago in Finland. There's this like viral post that every fall keeps coming back of the hair model that I did in Finland. And I did that same technique. Um, and it, and it utilizes natural shades versus fashion shades, muted shades with vibrant color. And what that does is it utilizes every single principle that you have in your arsenal. Like what makes a highlight stand out more? a low light. What can make something look more bright? Something that's more muted. So it uses every last part of our, of our color arsenal and it keeps us like on our toes. And I would say like, and I'm not saying I'm the pioneer of that by any means, everything is recycled and learned. But if you look back, I mean, some of the most like historic and iconic images utilize exactly that whenever it comes to color. So, and and I don't see it going anywhere. It hasn't in a while. It's just kind of 
um, evolved and morphed. So, I mean, I would just challenge people to, even if you, even if doing like, you know, natural color is your thing, like utilizing those principles and learning that will only make it better. And I think it'll excite your clients too. I mean, I do, I do everything under the sun whenever it comes to color. I do a lot of naturals as well, but I utilize these same principles that are kind of pulled from that. So, I mean, I don't know if that's exactly the answer you were looking for, but if I, I wasn't looking for any answer. I was looking for whatever <laughs> answer you gave me. Yeah, no, never, that's great. I never have anything clear or concrete. I, I really am uh, genuinely just cre- creative. Like I had to fill out this, um, this roster for, I'm doing some models in Mexico city, uh, some hair models. And it was the first time I was allowed to like t- tell them what I want to do. And I was like, I don't know. I usually just look at the person and I'm like, this is what makes sense. This would be exciting. Or I'll even have with any hair model, a few conversations with them. Like, who are you? What do you, what do you like? Cause I want to pull from your spirit. I want you to walk away loving this. And I'm just used to integrating all of those things in order to come up with something. And sometimes I have, oftentimes I have absolutely no idea how it'll turn out. That, that hair model I did yesterday, there were a few things that were totally different than what I had planned, but mm-hmm. it, it worked and it was beautiful and the principles were there and, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. I just like to keep it natural <laughs> and like creatively. No, that makes sense. And you're using your intuition when you're coming up with your, um, with your design. For example, your model has kind of bluish like steel bluish green with a little bit of green in her eyes Mm -hmm. and were you playing off of her eye color when you were coming up with with uh with her with with what color you were going to give her yeah eye color and that which you know like choosing kind of like muted plus blue is a risky factor but whenever that's where the the blush like pink you know, mm. it's kind of vibrant. I added a little bit of neon, so I don't even know what the hell color that is. But um, adding adding that in was an important part to tie it all together. I knew that I wanted to make her a sort of like natural copper, deep copper look. And mm. I wanted to deepen her base very much so to make those eyes completely pop. But not only was I looking at her eye color, but um, her skin tone. Mm-hmm. And then also her like lip color, like she actually didn't have any lip stain on or anything like that. So hmm. I was like, I just feel like this will only make you look more enriched um, by choosing this color. And then also once those fashion shades fade out, I mean, it looked so good when it was just in its natural raw blonde state. So she's going to have a good time with that color even after the creative part is over or washed out. Yes. Sure, because she's got uh, a lot of room on her root, doesn't she? Yeah. So she's not going to have to run back to you Yeah. Uh, after three weeks. Not, not a bit. All right, let's talk about social media, how you think about it generally. Uh, let's start with that. What are, what's, your, uh, what's your mindset on social media these days? My goodness, th- this is a very hot topic, and <laughs> um, it's definitely changed so, so much. My, the way that I think about it and the way that it, frankly, is. I mean, as I referenced the before times whenever social media, especially for hairdressers, I mean, we owned social media for a while. I mean, it was so cool to see um, all the positivity that it brought to the industry, how it for the first time it allowed us to branch away from having to codepend on brands and all that stuff. And you could individualize yourself and then the brands could come to you. Um, your clients could come to you. It wasn't like you didn't have to even depend on your salon, their name to, to, to gain a clientele. It was just all about you. And that's so important. And I think something that like as creatives, we, we need, and we aren't oftentimes fed. We're not told, enough that we're doing a good job or that we're, you know, I feel like it was just so, there was so much gatekeeping um, and social media broke us free from that. And it was just like this revolution. I don't know if you felt the same way when it was all going on, but like in the mm-hmm. beginning, but it was like, it felt like a revolution. It was beautiful. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it, it continued on that course for quite a while, but you know, especially after the pandemic happened, not only did, was there a shift in, mindset for the world but 
there was also a huge shift in how Instagram, Facebook, now Meta, the umbrella, it all changed. And, you know, I can see why it's really hard for hairdressers if you weren't if you weren't in it or anybody that's trying to, like, gain a following on social media or brand themselves. It's really hard to get that mass following um, or the engagement that you want. But nowadays, like, people don't – people – I will, when I look at my insights on a post, I'll see that it was shared so much, but some, like, I think that there was one day the other day I checked on a post, it had like 50 likes, but it was shared like over a hundred times. I'm like, yeah. what, you couldn't like it at the same time? All right, thanks. But yeah, people don't double tap as like they used no, to. No, they don't. Like, but, but I think that, you know, especially with like TikTok coming about, like scroll culture has also become so inflated and stuff like that to where people don't like don't engage the same way so anybody starting out it's definitely going to look a lot different um and my social media following has barely grown um over the past like four years um that doesn't mean that opportunity hasn't stopped and that's why i think it's important to stay the course because once again it just looks a little different now than it used to i used to get that buzz from getting lots of likes, getting the followers and all that stuff. And it was hard to like digest whenever that all kind of started to stop, but it wasn't just me. It happened to a lot of people. And after, you know, kind of doing a check-in, I was like, okay, well, this is just kind of the way that it is, but let's get back to basics. I, the first, my first post on my social media was when I was in beauty school. And I think I mentioned that on the first podcast, Mm -hmm. maybe, um, it was a picture of my note cards for my practical. And I was like, let's just, you know, I have my clients, I have my salon, like, let's just kick it back. And like, just posting ghost is one of the best, you know, things I've heard recently to where I don't put so much weight into it. Mm -hmm. And, but it still furthers me to like, continue on. Like I originally just wanted to show people what I could do and how I like to do it. And, uh, people faces, um, looks that inspire me that I want to do more of and the type of clients that I want. So let's just keep that trajectory going. And you kind of just never know when one is going to do well and Mm -hmm. putting less heart and weight in that makes it even better in some ways than expecting it to do well. Just, just Mm -hmm. put it out there. And once I kind of stopped caring as much, um, I felt like I had a healthier relationship with it. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you said that really well. You, once we, once we de, um, what's the word? Once we disconnect our our feelings from the engagement, you know, the numbers that show up on the post. I think a lot of people started uh, feeling a little bit better about this situation. There was definitely a period of time there where. People were trying to grasp for, you know, attention and the the metrics and the numbers uh, were very, very important to people. But what happens is, you know, they, they connected their feelings and their mood, you know, to whether a, a post did well or not. And then, th- and then you know, the entire thing matured. Um, thing being, you know, our industry on Instagram matured. Um, there was a great deal of content from a lot of people. The algorithm changed. Um, things were shaking up. And then you, you just had to kind of settle into the notion that you got to disconnect your feelings because how stupid is that, that my mood is going to be based on, you know, what uh, Meta has programmed into the algorithm and stuff like that. Um and it's something you can't really you're you're you can't really figure out. So you, you can spend a tremendous amount amount of time figu- trying to figure out it, it out, but it's just going to be highly frustrating for your your you know typical bread and butter behind the chair beauty professional who's not a uh, professional influencer. You know they're a professional hairdresser who sees their clients and the relationship with their clients is what's important. You know not having a whole bunch of likes so um what about tiktok are you on tiktok i am uh how's that going god it's so much harder <laughs> i Is mean it? i i don't know if it's like just the fact that i'm older and 
uh, I don't know. Oh my know. God, I'm what are you like, 35? Max. <laughs> well, you're like uh, 30. I'm going to be 34 in like three weeks. <laughs> there you go. I, I'm glad I got, I'm glad that was very risky, by the way, listeners. I hope all the listeners appreciate how risky that was. I took a stab in the dark. And that hey. could have really gotten my gotten me in trouble with Caitlin. You, you, Caitlin, you, you, you well. could have. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay. So you're 34, and um, you, you're calling yourself old. Well, maybe for the TikTok world, um, yeah. I feel I feel like I'm 16 years old, in many <laughs> ways. But um, I mean, as far as like what TikTok is looking for, I'm just not. Sh- I, I'm a natural person that likes to share and like show the way and the. The, the, I like to educate. I mean, that's why I got back into it. Um, and a lot of my videos are like the step-by-step or the transformation and stuff like that. And the only videos of mine that have taken off on TikTok are, are like these, like, like I have this one that I think has 3.4 million views and it's of me showing the starting process of cutting somebody's bangs like but cutting like a micro bang and I just start it by like cutting these notches into the hair that are so precise it's like to the to the hairdresser's eye you're gonna be like wow that's satisfying Mm -hmm. but to the TikTok realm it's like oh my god what did you do (laughs) and it was just kind of like showing a technical way of cutting um but man, was it put through the ringer. Like everyone hates it on TikTok. And, but it's the most popular thing and uh, on my oh page. Oh my God, I gotta go see it. I'm too curious. <laughs> I was yeah. thinking to myself, no, this is not a visual show. This is a podcast. It's not <laughs> entertaining to talk about something nobody could see, but I can't help myself. Okay, so what are you on TikTok? Uh, I think I'm hair by Caitlin Tishka. I, I get on there so much less than Instagram, so I think I'm hair. How fact often do you get on? Oh, I don't even scroll through it. <laughs> um, maybe okay, so. a couple times a month to post a video just to like keep keep taking a stab at that realm. Got it. Well, first of all, I'm gonna follow you. So I'm your four thousand six hundred and thirty eighth follower. And then I'm going to click on your thing. And by the way, I you're talking to, to somebody. To <laughs> you did? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. There you go. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'll go. Oh, look at that. 3.4 million views on this one. Okay. Wow. Oh, this is cool. Okay. So I'm just watching what she just described. And um, so, yeah, it's a short video and I could see non hairstylists probably looking at this and thinking, oh, my God, she's fucking up that perfect fringe bang (laughs) that she probably worked so hard to get perfect. And she's putting teeth in it, probably is what they're thinking. You have 1300 comments. (laughs) And okay, so this makes sense to me. Uh, but I mean, from, from my vantage point, it does, I see what you're doing. You're just adding a little texture, but they don't, they don't see that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, and a lot of people also said, like, I'm so tired of hairdressers just like doing videos like this for like to get a a rise out of people. And I was like, no, like that wasn't even my intention. I thought that like the execution was really cool. And then I asked a poll in the comments, like, if you or in the, the description, I was like, if you like this, I'll post how I finished this bang. Okay. And what what it actually turns into. Um, and then I did. And then there's somebody that argued with me on it, either on Instagram or on TikTok, that was like, you never posted the after. You're just after, <laughs> like, being, like, it was like a conspiracy. And I'm like, it's literally <laughs> on my page. I don't know what else to tell you. Like, I'll, should I go to the video and tag you <laughs> so that you You're see You're a this? malicious poster. Yeah, How yeah. How dare yeah. you say that? Yeah, so the, the feedback from TikTok is just very different. Um, I, it's still, like, once again, my mindset's changed with social media, so... I I prom I really don't care that much. Right. Um, and 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 that's I think you're in the right mindset. 
Yeah, so it's just like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's see. Right. This, the comments are just are you getting so in there? stupid. It's I'm bad. in. God damn it. It's bad. This is not... This is not what we should do on a podcast. The it's host crazy. ends up going deep on reading comments to himself. This is the reality, though. Like, you're not going to, you can't post stuff and be vulnerable and sh share your work as an artist and, and yeah. it get big without there being hate. I mean, no, nobody's successful not have haters. That, and this is just right. a prime example. Like, that's one tiny 100%. example of that. 100%. And YouTube's even worse, isn't it? I, oh, I hear that YouTube is just just a cesspool of people wanting to voice negative opinions. Yeah, I'm not on you like I'm not on YouTube. I think it would be <laughs> I mean, it might be fine, but geez oh, like yeah. What what I I've seen people tore up pretty hard on YouTube and Yeah. It's so sad. So, I don't I don't do that with other people. Like what? Right? What? Okay. Who are these people? We, we should, I mean, I'm sure there's an AI program that one could develop to go out there and just scrape all of the accounts who like to put negative comments on things. And then we could like create a an island somewhere to put all of those people who like to, to post negative comments. I think it would be great if like um, AI developed a heat map of people that only post hate versus people that post positivity. And then mm. you just have a color. You don't have like Ooh. a score. You're not told that you're bad nor good or that you're wrong or right. Maybe it's just like, hey, this person always says negative things. So they're in the orange red arena. Whereas this person Caitlin, is like good yellow idea. green. <laughs> well, you know who would be in the orange area is Kim Fahey. I can say that because she posted publicly on your thing. Love bangs, but like the straight classic look jagged edge makes it look like it's oily not clean that wasn't really that hateful actually that was just kind of a, an bad. opinion yeah that's her opinion anyway um no i like that is is black mirror that show that uh it's something like black something i think it's black mirror where they come up with these really wild ideas of like things and oftentimes technology based and in in the way that the world might be if if that was the way i think I, black I mirror seen it. i i've heard of it but i haven't seen it not yet yeah. but that sounds intriguing it actually kind of wants makes me want to dive into it it is pretty fascinating for example uh and hopefully listeners are not rolling their eyes and changing podcast episodes but um <laughs> there was one my favorite episode was where everybody has a score and the score is based off of like whether they're I think nice or something like that. I mean, it's been so many years since I've seen it. And so when you interact with other people, their score like appears above their head. And so everyone goes around terrified that they're going to get scored down or whatever, or their, their bad score is going to make them, you know, um, almost, uh, you know, people don't want to engage with them or something. It, anyway, it's, it's a fascinating show. Kind of yeah. almost like sci-fi, but in like a high-tech social way. It's sci-fi, but in a way that could, I mean could very well be reality if people, certain people really wanted it to be so. Well, and huh? and it, and I I say sci-fi, but actually China is trying such a thing. They, yes. There's a social credit uh, system, and they're trying it out in a uh, city in China, and. Um, Everyone yeah. has a social credit score. It's kind of like a financial credit score, except the social credit is is out there for people to see. And uh, so, I yeah, thought it's that pretty was wild. It'll it'll affect people being able to like even just like rent homes or do anything like that. So, totally yeah, have friends. Yeah, have you know, friends. Join groups. Like you know, you want to meet somebody to play tennis with. Your social score is gonna maybe prevent that. Yeah, the hardest part is like. So, you know, who is the one that is deciding what is socially acceptable? Of so, course. Yeah. Of course. And then, of course, is how accurate is the creation of that score? Okay. Right. We're not going to get into that any longer. <laughs> <Right. laughs> All right. What is the most difficult conversation you've ever had with a client in your chair? Well, okay. All right. There's, there's a few in a few different ways. Um, 
probably telling somebody that if after doing their hair for so long, if I still can't make them happy and come up with solutions that make them happy, that I shouldn't be the one doing their hair anymore. Um, this, this particular person just like was very latched to me, but also never liked what I did fully. And it was very defeating. You know, we, we as hairdressers really have, we have a, a ton of integrity and making somebody feel good is what we're doing this for. If mm -hmm. anybody leaves otherwise, it doesn't feel good to us. We don't feel no. good. Right. Um, at least if you're doing your job correctly, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but yeah. she just like kind of always had something negative to say or wanted me to like, quote, fix something. And I'm like, well, this isn't a fix. This is a change of heart. This is a change of opinion. Um, and I was like, and at this point, I, I, the, the last session that we had, I, I sent them a text and I gave them their money back from the, la the last session because they wanted me, I was going to come in on a day off yet again to like try and make this feel better oh. for them. Um. Yeah. So I sent them their money back without them even asking. And I said, I don't feel like I'm the hairdresser for the job. And I want you to take this money that you invested in me, and I want you to invest it in somebody else that can give you what you want. And their response was, but you're the one that, you know my hair better than anybody else. Like, I don't, I don't want to have to go somewhere else. And I was like, but you keep bringing me problems that I have no solution for. And if I don't have a solution, I can't do anything about it. And you should find somebody that maybe has a different perspective. And so that was a really hard one. It, it seems like it's a control thing. I mean, I've heard this so many times. And it's clearly the personality of the client. And it seems like it, it's a control thing. They love feeling like they have control over you. I mean, otherwise they would leave, right? Yeah. They would go find another hairdresser. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's kind of like, it doesn't even have to, like, in my suspicion is it didn't have anything to do with anything that I did. It, it was sure. completely outside of the realm of what, I, how I could make them happy. Totally. And it had nothing to do with the hair. And right. I knew it um, because the hair looked great. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, you can tell me you don't totally like something and I'll, I'll finagle it and get it closer to what you want. I, I can be told that stuff, but... After a while, I was like, this just doesn't make sense anymore. And um, you, you got to find something that makes more sense to you. I mean, if, if you're not going to invest yeah. it in another hairdresser, maybe invest it in, I don't know, some a therapist. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Like, there you but go. At the, at the end of the day, we're, we, we're only here to like perform the job that we're there to do. And not everyone's styles are going to mesh. So that, that was one that was... Um, that was pretty hard. Uh, when I was in beauty school, oh my god, they 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 sent me all the craziest stuff at this at this beauty school because it was just you know the tiniest little thing and nobody knew <laughs> nobody knew what anybody was doing. But this woman came in and she had done an at home perm oh on her bleached hair, and it was my first time experiencing over processed hair. And I mean, when we're saying over processed, we're talking like the viral videos that you see of the sponginess, like just, and it was done up to, it was a perm, so it was done up to the root. And they wanted me, my, my instructors asked me to fix it. And I was like, well, I'm washing it and the hair's just coming out. I can't really fix it. Um, <laughs> There's no fixing this situation, frankly. Right. Do we sell but, wigs? Right. But I like I was talking to her and I just like decided to not like listen to my instructors anymore. And I was talking to her and I was like, listen, this hair, whether I cut it off today or not, is going to come off. It will. Um I was like, so about where you have like hair that is strong enough is at about like two inches. I was like, I think a good thing to do would be to cut it to four. I can give you a pixie cut. I can leave a little bit on the top. I was like, but just so you know, this will eventually leave you. <laughs> and she cried, but she was like, 
thank you for being honest with me because I've been tired of wasting my time trying to mm. find somebody that will can, that can do something about it because everybody would just wouldn't be upfront with her enough. Yeah. So she cried. We hugged. Mm. I showed her some examples of what her hair is going to look like today and what she can grow it out to. We cut it. And then at the end, she liked it. Really? <laughs> she Amazing. Had like, she had like hair to here. And then she left with a total t- like micro pixie. Wow. But but like she actually like left smiling. And that was it was, a, it was a total adventure. Um, but yeah. What a learning lesson. Yeah. To get that in beauty school, that's so great, I think. And for it to have a positive outcome. Yeah. Was and not so expecting that. <laughs> did, did she, and I know these are beauty school clients, but did she, have you, did you see her after that? No, I think she was one of the last people, like for me, whenever, because I was towards yeah. the end of my beauty school ventures. Okay. Yeah. How interesting. Well, um, I normally ask a wave the wand question, but I already kind of asked you that. Uh, let's go to the hair horror stories. Do you have any hair horror stories? I mean, you already yeah. kind of gave us a couple, but do you have any like that ended poorly? Oh, for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think we've all gone through this one. This uh, this is a pretty uh, a pretty common one. But the first time that you like foil somebody's hair and the bleach turns to water, there's literal smoke. The hair is destroyed. Yeah, my first time encountering that, uh, it was wild. I'm so happy that like I was checking on it as I was going. But yeah, like you know, I think that there's a lot of places in the world that have. But here in Missouri. We have, like, tons of people that come from the country, and they have, like, well water, tons of mineral buildup. And this mm-hmm. was, like, before we had any options to treat that beforehand, mm-hmm. at least to my knowledge. Mm-hmm. And, oh, my gosh, the first time I experienced that, I wanted to quit my job. I was like, there are just too many factors <laughs> here, and her hair is destroyed. Like, I, I the, the underneath of her hair is just completely destroyed, and there's mm-hmm. nothing you can do about it at that point. And you... We're not equipped with the credentials to have a microscope to look at what's fully on the hair, which I don't understand why we're not. We're already like addressing, question. we're already addressing these things so visually and um, through texture and other things. Like, why why not just equip us with the with the knowledge and the way to like look into the hair more deeply so that we can just like not it not be a guessing game constantly. But have you ever tried that? I mean, a microscope is not that expensive you know they have them you would need to see like also inside wouldn't you i don't know i don't know i mean you could just take a strand you know like you do a a strand color test or whatever except you take the strand and you put it under a microscope microscopes are like less than 100 bucks you know my kids have them and you could put like you know we've put a nail under actually i think we put a hair on it and you could see the condition of of the hair shaft, and I wonder uh, if I wonder if it's difficult to determine, you know, what what what's going on there. Uh, maybe I, it is, but I think that it could be easier than what we think. I think it would be very revolutionary if we like it, like approached it from that standpoint, because mm-hmm. I think it could be a lot easier. The thing is, we would have to then, when it comes to schooling and stuff like that, you would have to be able to identify what is uh, mineral on the hair and like those, those different things. But I think that could be so easy. And I mean, let's face it, the people that are developing products and scientists already know how to just like Mm -hmm. give us a skosh of that. And then we can take Mm -hmm. it further. Like, I mean, I think that it would be a very easy thing to do. All you'd have to do is take like two strands of someone's hair before you do a chemical service, look at it under a microscope. And then you could be like, Oh, well, it looks like we're going to need these pretreatments and you can literally show them why and it won't be like a like, you know, a conspiracy to them or or something right. like that. So, yeah. I mean, I think it would be cool. I'd be, I'd do it. I'd I'd get certified in that. I'd pay for that. I mean, you could do that on a video. I I'm all that would be you could, you know, educate through um a video for that. Yeah. There you go. We'll That's your next thing to do. It's the next thing. <laughs> That's your next thing. Just add it to the list. Yeah. All right. Do you have any last words for the community? Um, well, I'm just 
happy to be here and happy to be a part of it. Uh, um, I'm really happy to have started my education adventures again, and uh, it's gaining quite a bit of traction in a way that I didn't realize, and and it's fulfilling me a lot. So I'm really excited to have a continuation of that. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess just be on the lookout. I'm going to do some shit I always do. Uh, I love it. And uh, yeah, that's all. I mean, mainly just grateful. And thanks for like having me again, Eric, and thinking that I have enough interesting things to say for your podcast. Um, your podcast has always been super cool. So I appreciate it. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate it, too. I appreciate the time, and you've absolutely had very valuable things to say. That's why we did two episodes, Caitlin yeah. Tichka. <laughs> two episodes. Two episodes. All <laughs> right. Well, look her up. She's here by Caitlin Tichka. It's T-Y-C-Z-K-A. Mm -hmm. And uh, look her up, and uh, maybe she's coming to a city near you. And congratulations with your uh, Schwarzkopf deal and, and best of luck with everything. Thanks so much for having the conversation with me. Awesome. Thanks, Eric.